Hello everyone and welcome to our second ever fully live version of the Hacking with Friends show. My name is Cody Kinsey, I'm a security researcher with Veronis, and this is Michael, he is our top production gremlin. And today we're going to be taking your questions live and answering also some of the questions that have been left on the Security Forward mm -hmm. YouTube channel. So thank you to everyone who's joining us today. We've already got some really great questions in. Uh, yeah, and we're going to be looking at the chat throughout this to make sure we see your questions and get them answered. Uh, and the first question is, how are we doing today, Michael? I'm doing pretty all right. Ready for the weekend. <laughs> I'm a little hungry. Otherwise, yep. great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, do we want to start with the nice quest softball question, by yeah. the way? Thanks for leading in with that. I really appreciate we that. We had a uh, question from the previous Q&A that we can start off with as well, if you want me to read that. Hey, Cody, uh, what WAN hat do you use with your Pi? Okay, so this question has some assumptions. One is that I use a WAN hat with my Pi. Yeah. Um, so I didn't even know what that was until about two months ago, where I discovered some really cool uh, cellular data mm -hmm. hats with your Pi that get 4G. They're more expensive than the Pi itself. I kind of feel like back when I was doing photography and like each lens was like twice the, the price of the camera. But if you add a cellular data hat to your Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. it basically is able to connect to data from anywhere where there's a cellular connection. So for the stuff mm -hmm. I like to do, you know, like war driving or something like that, where I want to be constantly uploading data, uh, it's pretty cool. It basically gives you like a, a, almost like a router in your car that you can connect other devices to, you can do things mm -hmm. you want to. Um, so there's a, a lot of really cool stuff you can do with one of these hats. I use a WaveShare one. It's a 4G WaveShare um, hat, and uh, I have barely tested it. Yeah. So, you know, we, we used to live in the middle of nowhere where it was very mm -hmm. important for us to try to find any data connection we could get, but we've since moved and now have gigabit uh, internet, so it's less of a priority to be testing this stuff. But as I start building my own drones, I look uh, forward to getting back into doing this so I can pilot them. Yeah, one thing I would also say there is if... I would look into getting like just an M.2 hat, um, and then that way you can just take any M.2 um, LTE modem card and put it in there. These are the same kind of modem cards you would put in like your Lenovo laptop to make it, um, you know, use LTE instead of Wi-Fi or something like that. So th there are a variety of options that might be a little more flexible than just a straight up hat with a soldered on, you know, modem and all. Although that might be easier to start with. Okay, all right. So yeah. I have so, a, a question from the live audience, uh, and this is one that um, I get a lot, and that's, is it possible to make an undetectable payload with Kali Linux? Uh, and originally the, the comments that I would get on YouTube were just like, how do I make FUD payload? I need to make FUD payload. It's like, who is FUD? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And then I see it's fully undetectable. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, so this is one of those questions where I'm not quite sure to, how to answer sometimes yeah. because Undetectable by what? Or does your target have right. antivirus, Windows, Windows Defender? Like, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you, what exactly are you trying to do? If you just want to make it resistant to antivirus, mm -hmm. I've seen some great security talks on packing files where you just mm -hmm. zip it, zip it, zip it, zip it, and the, it's compressed so much, or like put into a different algorithm that, that compresses it that like no antivirus can figure out what the hell it does, even if it's, if it's literally the oldest, most detectable mm -hmm. virus in the book. Right. So creating an undetectable payload, that's pretty easy. The, the problem here is like, you know, what do you want it to do? Like, do you, like, are you having it do something that's going to trigger Windows Defender? That's a whole different ball game because then it depends, like, what action you're trying to perform. And then there's a very specific thing you have to do to evade that. So for just evading antivirus, super easy. I, I just zip it enough times and, like, uh, most antivirus programs can't figure out what a zipped file e is. Even if it's, like, virus.virus virus, and then you zip it six times, like, a lot of the time a, a antivirus scanner has no idea. Boom, undetectable payloads. But I think what most people are asking is, can you create a script that does, like, a whole list of bad things mm -hmm. and doesn't get caught? Well, I need to know what that list of bad things is step by step by step by step to answer that well, question, and it's probably going to be a very long answer. So yes, it is possible to develop a completely, fully um, mm -hmm. undetectable payload, but you need to know what do you want to do? What device are you doing it on? Mm -hmm. Do you like what? What is the end goal? Are you stealing data? Are you doing ransomware? What's are you the stealing passwords? Like? What's the target environment like? Yeah. What stuff do they have installed? Like yeah. all these things are going to be very important to, to fully answer that question. Well, and it, I just see a Windows Defender. 
there's like eight, there's not only Windows Defender, there's like five other different mechanisms in Windows that will stop code uh, executing in certain ways. Yeah. So the answer to your question is yes, it's very possible. I cannot give you the full details because you would need to provide me with a complete list of everything you want to do on that computer. And Windows Defender is not your only enemy. There's like, mm -hmm. uh, as we were working with Tim, there's a bunch of underlying processes that stop the execution of, of known malicious code or, or certain other things yeah. that just make it a nightmare to, to try to answer that question. So that's not an answerable question in like a short period of time. Mm -hmm. You either need a specific program that has like something that it's doing that's triggering a specific mechanism, I can answer that, or we can like go through it, or like a very narrow list of things that you want to yeah. do. So, well, um, kind of iterating on that, like I know it's a little semantic, but like you can't have anything that's fully undetectable in the same way that you can't have something that's unhackable, right? Like uh, there's two elements of that. Like first of all, like the intrusion getting in past like, antivirus and stuff but then also like once you've done stuff you, the footprints you've left like mm. you know there's logs everywhere like i th i think it's a little silly sometimes the notion that you could do the perfect hack and get away scot-free and no one would ever be able to detect it okay like, you can totally do that difference of opinions here yeah if you have enough money and time you can you can do what michael just said you can't do but I mean, the, the thing here is if you're a beginner, if you're mm. looking to just do something like evade, uh, now the question is how do we create like a meterpreter session? Yeah. Uh, again, it depends on the target environment. You know, do they, have they recently patched? Is it all the way up to, you know, too many, there's too many variables to answer that question. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll do a live stream on meterpreter or something like that at some point, but fully undetectable payloads, totally possible, depends on your target environment lots of underlying variables. It's not just Windows Defender. So mm -hmm. I recommend uh, following guides on uh, setting, like doing Meterpreter and then just looking at what pops up and then you can determine like what you need to bypass from there. And there's plenty of guides on bypassing individual mechanisms on Windows. Mm -hmm. I recommend that you look those up. Um, so another question that we got was, uh, what made you start doing this? Michael. Um, narrow the question a li little bit, like ha you what, mean hacking? Yeah, hacking, or? hacking and also doing uh, this sort of sh uh, show, because you're also okay, a guest yeah. on the Null So YouTube basically, um, one day I was just curious about hacking and I started watching YouTube videos on it and those ended up being like DEF CON conference talks. And I was like, oh, hey, this seems like really, really cool. You know, maybe I should go there one year. And, um, you know, one year I decided I'll do it. Just do it. I went alone. I didn't know anyone there. Um, I ended up meeting Cody there. Uh, we talked. He was working at Nullbyte at the time. Mm -hmm. I started writing for them. And, you know, um, basically just writing articles as I learned about things. Trying, kind of following the philosophy of, like, teaching others is the best way to learn yourself. Um, and I did that. And next thing you know, I'm here on a live stream. So, yeah. Uh, so my story is I learned to hack Wi-Fi a long time ago because Wi-Fi is extremely expensive uh, in certain parts of the United States, especially if you don't have good credit or no credit. It's mm -hmm. up to $200. And if you just moved into an apartment, you're trying to get a job, especially if you just moved to Los Angeles like I had, it's really difficult to scrape together $200, not to pay for the internet, just for the deposit. Mm -hmm. So let's just say I learned how to hack Wi-Fi as a matter of necessity because not having a lot of money and needing internet in the modern age to get a job, I learned that it wasn't that hard to bypass certain security protocols. And that really made me understand that the whole world was like this. I mm -hmm. thought as a kid that everything that had like a padlock on it was locked, like you couldn't get through it. Mm -hmm. But just realizing how full of holes Wi-Fi was made me first realize that this is a rabbit hole I could go down forever. And it was really fascinating to me. And second, I slowly realized that I might be able to make money doing this. So I signed up to be an author at Nullbyte. I basically would follow guides on the internet, learn how to do something, and then the next day I would teach people what I had done and uh, basically go through all the, the problems that had popped up. So I found that there were lots of great guides on the internet, but nobody really went through all the individual steps, at least very consistently. And I got the idea to start doing video work. When I brought it up, uh, the people who were in charge said that it was a terrible idea, that they didn't have the money for it, that it would be too difficult to scale, and that they wanted to stick with stuff that they already knew. Mm -hmm. So I did it anyway, because I'm great at following instructions. And because I didn't listen, we created the first few episodes of Nullbyte in my living room uh, for no pay. We did it for free. And once those went up and got a big reaction, uh, we got a different attitude from the people who were in charge. And that's how Nullbyte was uh, born. 
So after doing that for a couple years, I realized that now I was in a position to actually start lifting up other people instead of just doing things myself. So I met other people at hacking conferences. I started really engaging in the hacker community. I met Michael as well as many of our other co-stars on the Nullbyte channel and on Security Forward. And these people are kind of what drove me to feel like I'd found my people and really get involved in the hacker community, get involved in research and start figuring out the kind of stuff that I wanted to do within all these uh, great smart people. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we have, another, uh, we have another great question. A lot of people are stuck indoors in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, I have way too much time. What should I spend it on? Hmm. Um, I really like DEF CON conference talks, but I'm a little biased. On yeah, that. one great thing you can do is if you want to watch videos, there's a lot of great conference talks that mm -hmm. are on a variety of different subjects that you might figure out is something you're really passionate about. So yeah. if you want to check out some things that other hackers have done, DEF CON conference talks are really, really great. Mm -hmm. I personally recommend um, if you have the time now to buy a piece of hardware and play with it, Especially, yeah. I love MicroPython. I love the ESP8266. I have a whole class that I did mm -hmm. on like programming NeoPixel lights for like holiday decorations and stuff. And it is so much fun to be able to like you know program some lights over Wi-Fi with a little bit of basic Python. So if yeah. you know a little bit of programming or you're you've got the ability to set aside some time to take a Udemy class and like learn mm -hmm. Python or something like that, you could be programming lights for you know like twenty to fifty dollars. Uh, and it's it's really quite striking and cool the different kind of art projects and other sorts of like uh, just hardware projects you can do. So yeah. my current thing is buying cheap hardware and playing with it, trying to make uh, projects out of it. I made like a giant clock out of like a bin and NeoPixels on an ESP8266 that just like showed the time. Yeah. So like projects like that are super fun, teach you programming. Michael and I were just writing ransomware the other day for our live stream and like spending- For a live stream. For a live stream. For a live stream. And spending the day programming with Python and with Bash yeah. in my case was just refreshing and fun. Mm -hmm. So working on projects like that, uh, little programming projects that you can do a write up mm -hmm. on maybe and teach other people about or that are just satisfying yeah. has been keeping us sane. To, to elaborate on what I was saying, so I would basically, if you don't know a specific project that you would want to work on, like find an area of subject that you're interested in. Say, for example, like I'm really into aviation. So like there's a whole aviation village at DEF CON. Just go there and watch all those talks. And then maybe that'll spark interest in a more specific project you want to work on. And then that's the second thing I would say is find a specific project, a specific goal that you're interested in. It doesn't have to be something you know how to do now, but something that you want to know how to do. And then that, that journey of learning how to do that thing will take a lot of time and you'll really increase your skill set that way and you'll enjoy the process and it, it'll be less tedious than like, you know, forcing yourself to go to school in some ways. Definitely, definitely. So we had another question from the audience that was asking about the ESP8266, a mm. small Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller we do a lot of work with. And they were basically asking, is it possible to make that uh, connect to Wi-Fi and actually provide a Wi-Fi connection? Now, I've seen some, uh, I've seen some indications that there is a way to do this. Um, mm. I have not done it myself personally, but I've seen that you can potentially be able to go back and forth between providing like a data connection, um, the way of doing this also seems to be kind of complicated because you need to upload like firmware that's not an Arduino. So this is not like a beginner style project. And I haven't seen it demonstrated. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have seen the people at Pentester Academy like selling devices and doing stuff uh, that supposedly can act as mm -hmm. a, a NAT router, which is pretty cool, honestly. But I, myself, and also my friend Stefan, who are quite familiar with the mm -hmm. ESP8266, tried to load this on to one and it was uh, it was a nightmare. Yeah, just so um, I understand the question, uh, are they essentially wanting to create a repeater that is taking in a Wi-Fi signal and then Basically, repeating yes. it out? Basically, yes. Yeah. Basically, so we're using an ESP8266 to like connect to a real to a Wi-Fi network and then provide internet to people who connect. Right. It's really stressing the hardware on it. I, I've heard yeah. that you can. I've seen GitHub projects that say you can. They do not use Arduino. They use like custom compiled compiled yeah. firmware, and it There's is. A not a couple things stuff. I would say there is first of all since you can only be doing one thing at a time on the ESP I would like try to do it with like two where one is connected to the network and then the other one is repeating it out um, but then also I would remind people that the ESP is 2.4 gigahertz only and mm -hmm. it has relatively limited bandwidth so you're not going to be doing a ton of like high speed stuff alright let's do the next question um 
Um, how can I get an admin password for a router? All right, so Google I have, foo. I, I have two responses to that. First, try password and admin, and that's mm. going to get you through about like 80% because those are default passwords that are extremely common yeah. across routers. But the, the, the way that almost anybody can get into a router that's configured by default is to just look up the brand of router and mm -hmm. then look up the default password. Yeah. And nine out of, uh, maybe eight out of 10 times, people never change this password. I don't know why, they don't think it's important. I guess they think that like nobody but them is gonna be in their network. Yeah. But you'll find this flaw in like coffee shops and like other public places that offer public Wi-Fi, they just mm -hmm. let anybody basically log into their router. To elaborate on that procedure a little, uh, there's like a handful of common passwords that I would try very quickly. Admin, no password, root, no password, admin, 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 password, root, password, root, tor. Um, there might be a couple others there that I'm not thinking of right now. But once you've tried those basics real quick, if you don't find um, that one of those works, then usually the splash page will indicate the brand of router and then just Google that brand name of router and default password and you're you're likely to find something. Beyond that, then you start getting into brute forcing and stuff like that, which is gonna be a little more complicated. Yeah, it's basically if you're brute forcing a router, you just need to be have your program be able to tell what a successful versus mm -hmm. unsuccessful login looks like. So there, it's not quite as straightforward as brute forcing SSH or something, but you basically will point it at the HTTP login page, you'll train it on what a failed response looks like, and mm -hmm. it'll just keep on going until it gets a different response. And that's how a lot of programs are capable of brute forcing basically any web page that doesn't do rate right. limiting, which a lot of routers don't. Yeah, but like Cody was saying, like 80, 90% of at least like home or small business routers never are gonna it. like be default. Now once you start getting into um, certain small businesses that have a lot of people on their Wi-Fi network, like certain restaurants um, or large, medium sized to large businesses are definitely gonna have that much more locked down. Um, so I don't know what medium <laughs> businesses well, you've been going to. That oh, okay, well, let's just say yeah, from what so, I've seen, so. that's not the case. Yeah. But, all right, so we have another question, uh, and that's, will I ever be on Cyber Weapons Lab again? Uh, and the answer is yes. I actually just recorded the Cyber Weapons Lab like three or four days ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Yes, we have so much content on Cyber Weapons Lab that is actually queued back <laughs> for months. So when yeah. like you guys are gonna see me with various lengths of hair and various places. I'm gonna be in like a oh, log. Sets yeah, I'm gonna be in like a, a log cabin. Too. I'm gonna be in like a science room. Mm -hmm. I'll be in like my like. X room in Los Angeles. It's yeah. we're gonna be all over the place. But yes, I will still be in null byte episodes. Thank you for asking. Hack five episodes as well. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite DEF CON talk from this year? Ooh, I didn't really watch that I many was from this year. Busy. Yeah, yeah, so I was uh, presenting at the Hope Conference and also doing some work for Black Hat. Mm -hmm. So Sorry, oh, we, we actually uh, didn't well, get a chance to watch I, many of them. I, I did see a bunch of them getting posted like a week or so ago. Um, and that's, I mentioned it earlier, but like the aviation village really piqued my interest because like um, I'd done previous live streams on like ADSB hacking and stuff like that. And I mm. saw that there was a talk on ADSB spoofing, which is something we didn't really get into in my live stream, but is like really, really interesting and super scary if you at all like realize the like how that could be implemented and the, the effects that could have. Yeah, actually, now that I think of it, I believe that Vic did a talk. So we, mm -hmm. we did um, a podcast with Vic, uh, Vic Harkness, and she did a talk on defeating, I believe it was defeating... Um, um, Self-driving cars. Self-driving cars. Basically, like if you painted lines on, or used a projector to project lines on the asphalt, um, if you placed cones and stuff like this, um, how would a self-driving car react? And, um, you know, not to spoil it, but like you can do some pretty interesting things, uh, you know, yeah, a so bunch I of cones around the car makes it think that it can't go anywhere. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> signal's taking forever to load, but I believe I have the YouTube link for this. So I'll drop it in, I'll make sure it's not private and then I'll drop it in. Right. And uh, I believe this is a link to the talk on, uh, yeah, here we go, it is. Cool, the car hacking village. So if you guys wanna mm -hmm. check out a great talk by someone we like very much, um, I'm dropping the link right now and it is uh the talk is titled houston we have a problem <laughs> yeah you know i i know i keep saying it but that's one of the things i really can't stress enough is like find a village that you're really interested in and you're gonna find a lot more 
talks that you find interesting because like DEF CON is just so huge. There's so many videos on so many different topics. It, you can get a little lost mm. um, sometime. And then some of them can be a little drier, um, maybe not as spicy as you would want. Mm. So if you find a village, then you can easily go through a playlist and find the ones that are juicier and more interesting to you. Absolutely. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, basically, this person is Whoa, saying that's a big comment. that we Please should. slow down. There's no yeah. rush with this quality of information. I'd like to be able to absorb all of what you're saying. Break this into a five-part series and slow it down. We'll help your channel and uh, metrics-wise and also make it a much easier to fill. We, I know that we go through a lot of content on mm -hmm. the live stream, but trust me, we're already trying <laughs> so hard to, to um, be able to not overwhelm you guys and also yeah. uh, get stuff out there that's kind of for beginners mm -hmm. and intermediate intermediate people as well. Right. So I was thank you say, for your comment. We're probably not going to slow down that much. Yeah. But um, we do yeah. uh, have, for example, when we're going to do something on ransomware, we're probably going to do something mm -hmm. on like hashing and encryption mm -hmm. first just so you guys are a little bit more versed on it. So we will do a couple series that kind of prepare mm -hmm. you guys for something that's maybe a little bit more advanced. But we're also starting to do more discussion style topics like this and, and be able to get you guys to interact with us, get your questions answered, and kind of focus on the stuff you guys care about so we can uh, do some of the, the explaining that we don't get to do when yeah. we're doing something more technical. We're basically Basically balancing between something that's very notoriously hard to do, which is live demos, or mm -hmm. at least demos that like we have a little bit of control over to not dox ourselves or, or get anything right. that's going to get us kicked off the internet uh, on the screen, uh, and then things that you know kind of empower our viewers and allow mm -hmm. us to do things more live. So for the more technical stuff, like there's really a lot to show you guys in order to fully explain the way these, these things work. So if we lose you guys, if you have any questions, please post questions on the video. We will mm -hmm. get to them when we do our live Q&A. You can jump in here as well and ask questions. So um, um, yeah. And yeah, kind of uh, multiple points on that. Uh, one of the eternal problems we've had with our video content is the wide variety of skill sets of the people that watch us. You know, everyone, uh, from the very new beginners all the way to people who have been in this career for like two decades or more. Um, so there's a lot of frustration on both sides that we're going too fast or too slow, that we spend too much time talking about certain things and not others. So just try to bear with us, understand that we're trying to strike a good middle ground between all of that. Uh, do remember that the content is recorded. Um, uh, or once we stream it, it is recorded and available for you on YouTube. And in the YouTube playback settings, you can either increase or decrease the playback speed. Um, so that can be helpful if we're going a little too fast. Um, you know, if we're going too fast, you can always pause, uh, go back. All right, now we're going too slow. Yeah. All right, so our next question is about Flipper Zero. So uh, this is a question from the chat that is basically about this really cool device. Can we switch my screen? Um, Flipper Zero is uh, a Kickstarter project that I was just made aware of, of actually by somebody I work with. Like a week or so. Yeah, right. we took a look yeah. at it, and it was trying to make their goal of $60,000 at the time. And it is, um, <laughs> I think they got that. Let's just say that it has it has gone past this. So um, the developer is a Russian dude. I believe his um, Twitter picture is of a praying mantis. I've been talking to him a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, not only told him that this device looks super cool, but also that I want one so we can put it on the show. So as soon as we get one, uh, he mm -hmm. got back to me and said that as soon as they have them available, uh, they'll try to bring one to us so that we can do them for probably a Hack 5 episode, a live stream, and then maybe even a Null Byte episode. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty cool. And, what does it do again? Uh, so Flipper Zero has a bunch of different things baked in. It has like uh, like SDR stuff We can stuff watch the video in. on stream if you oh, want. Well, I mostly just want to get to the part that we made fun of. Um, so you can see this little Tamagotchi-style hacking device. Uh, where is it? Um, in the current hardware configuration has some like, color <laughs> okay, I don't know what's going on with this. Like, honestly, I think the marketing is the best on this, like all the little animations and well, the and stuff. yeah, the like Ponagachi was like was cool and like made people like mm -hmm. think of this as uh, a game or like a device right. that's able to be more flexible. You can see this is designed to also so it's got like, like an SDR do in signal it, analyzation, yeah. like ha has a transponder so it can like replay signals back. And uh, I think that that's really cool because it's also got RFID. So yeah, we are aware of this project. I made fun of the developer a little bit because of the way he was soldering some shit, which was crazy. Um, and he took it in good fun and uh, said that he'd get back to me with it. So I think it's a really cool project. I've also been persistently harassed 
by this project on Instagram at this point by <laughs> just like being advertised like, hey, go give money to this project immediately. And I'm like, I'm not, he's going to give you one for free. Stop bothering me. Well, they must be um, spending a fortune on ads or is it like organic? Well, when you have $4 million it? from your Kickstarter, yeah, you, you might as well invest some of it there. back and see if you can yeah. make five, I guess. Yeah. So yes, we're aware of uh, this project. We think it's super cool and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we get our hands on one because it looks great. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to uh, the main screen. Yeah, I just remembered. I forgot to do the thing I said. I no! What's oh, this? It's stuck it. All right, all right, we're back. Okay, so um, we checked out Flipper Zero. Um, so the next question is, will you have any videos on reverse engineering applications with Ghidra? That is a great question because that is exactly what we were planning on doing. So mm -hmm. in our little quarantine house, we just had someone move in who has a background in reverse engineering, which I do not. And we were discussing things that we, and it's our friend Brandon, he was on another live stream that we did. And um, we were discussing things that we could do to maybe teach you guys how reverse engineering works and how to just take like a random program and reverse engineer it and see what it mm -hmm. does. So if you guys are interested in that, I am super interested. Uh, so I'm gonna bring it up again and I think that will be one of the ones we try to do in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the question. I think reverse engineering is super cool. I've also tried to get uh, Marcus, AKA Malware Tech, uh, to come and he's a friend of ours and we're gonna see if he can do a reversing guide with us as well. But as you might imagine, he's super busy and also insists in doing it in C, which I do not know very well. So we've been trying to find a good like middle ground for us to do a mm -hmm. demonstration. So hopefully we'll have both uh, someone that I know and then maybe an InfoSec celebrity come in and uh, teach us a little bit about reversing. All right, let's do the next question. Okay. Um, let's see, have you, ever, have you guys seen a project that leverages the SD card slot to store packet capture data? This was on the ESP32 cam. So right, so the ESP32 yeah. is a microcontroller that's Wi-Fi connected, it has dual cores and it's also been successfully used as a sniffer. So it's able mm -hmm. to receive a lot of the information from uh, just Wi-Fi packets that are nearby and store them. So if you're doing war driving, this is something that's very easy to do. If you are doing uh, just general packet capture, while we have seen some issues with it, we actually do know of some projects that are successfully able to take an SD card slot and store wireless data on it. So great question. Uh, it kind of makes it like a portable wireless sniffer. But again, I have not yet successfully cracked like a handshake that's captured. I believe some of the input might be truncated a little bit or otherwise shortened, which might limit its usefulness. But if you're just looking into packet metadata, what the device was, where it was sending to, what network it was connected to, and you know that kind of information, it should work just fine. Um, let's look at the next question. Uh, um, is accessing ah. stuff on Shodan illegal? Okay, so there's a very thin line between something being legal and illegal. So if we discover a webcam on Shodan and it is wide open, there's no password, it is legal for us to take a look at it. And this was the case in several, I think this uh, live stream that we did, mm -hmm. um, where we found a couple webcams that a required absolutely no authentication. Totally legal to do, a little weird, but totally legal to do. We'll freak you out eventually. Yeah. Um, now, if we go to a webcam and it has a brand that we know, um, you know, has a very common default password, it is illegal for us to put in the password and try to log even in. Even if it's default. Even if yeah. it's default, right. So even though we're not an idiot and we know what the password is, mm -hmm. or it even might say the password on the page, which does happen, it is still accessing a computer network that is secured and secured with the password, and that is and crossing. And we're not intended to have access. Yeah, to and, and that is is crossing the line and could be seen as a crime. Mm -hmm. So uh, just be aware that there is a very fine line when you're working with Shodan. As soon as you're putting in credentials and logging in, you're you're not just looking anymore. But if you're just no. looking, if you're accessing stuff that doesn't require a password, then that should be fine. And you know mandatory legal disclaimer here. We are not lawyers and we're not providing legal advice. Sure. If you need legal advice, consult a professional lawyer. Um, next question? Yeah. Um, okay, can I use a Node MCU to uh, make a Wi-Fi dock? Yes, the answer to that is yes. You can use any ESP8266 based microcontroller to make a Wi-Fi dock, but you'll still need a SparkFun Pro Micro or the CMJD, I believe it is Beetle. Um, which is a uh, 80 mega, whatever, whatever, uh, baseboard. So, uh, it provided you have both those things, you can stick them together, make a Wi-Fi duck, hack computers from like blocks away over Wi-Fi. Yeah. Super cool. Wi-Fi ducks are really cool. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience and we have one, I'll try to get through a couple of these. So first is how can get cookies from login page? I need a lot more information. Uh, I'm sorry, before Canary I can answer tokens? that question. Um, or... no, that has nothing to do with okay. cookies. 
Um, I don't like login cookie. Mm -mm, sorry, I, I'm not sure how to answer that one. No. Uh, there's probably some tools that would do that, but without knowing which kind of cookies you're getting from which login, like what are you logging into, I, I'm going to steer clear of that one for now. Um, technical questions uh, that apply to specific scenarios, we're probably not going to be able to answer very well. Um, let's see. I have seen some alternative videos to the Wi-Fi Pineapple with the Raspberry Pi. Could you make a video about alternatives to the Wi-Fi Pineapple, or would that conflict with uh, interest with Hack5? Great question. So of course we do work with Hack5 who makes the mm -hmm. Wi-Fi Pineapple. We have seen some alternatives to this uh, just using the Raspberry Pi and a bunch of mm -hmm. wireless cards. Um, one of the older ones was the, the, pumpkin pie? the Wi-Fi Pumpkin, but that project's no longer oh. maintained. So I actually don't know of any currently maintained projects that compete with that. If I knew of them, I would definitely, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't steer you Isn't guys like elsewhere. the Pineapple based on OpenWAR and like, it, like the, the, I feel like the Pineapple software is actually available, like you can just I don't remember that. Yeah, oh, oh, it Google is, or Google. it's not maintained. Yeah. Um, so it hasn't been maintained for like over oh, a year. Okay, so it's yeah. it's kind of a dead, pro it's a derelict project and there are things that will, will go wrong and there will be no fixes for it. Mm -hmm. So um, I only like to recommend maintained projects and that's not one that's maintained anymore. So uh, there are, we'll take a look and see if there's other stuff out there because I do think that um, the Wi-Fi pineapples maybe not in everyone's price range and there's some open source tools that do a lot right. of what it does. Some of the attacks um, from the Wi-Fi pineapple, we've actually moved to the ESP8266. Mm -hmm. So check out the ESP8266 D author, especially the new V3 that has a lot more features packed in. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I'm too nervous to even download Ghidra. It's okay, the NSA is your friend. <laughs> um, stupid question, but I can uh, ASN Lookout without a proxy. May have used a site for a demo, but not, wasn't sure if I get in trouble for it. I don't know. I'm uh, sorry, I don't have enough information. Um, can I ASN? I'm sorry, uh, I'll have to think about that more. Um, da, da, da. I can do uh, another. What's your favorite go-to hardware device, like a Hack5 Pineapple? Okay, that's great. Um, so for my favorite, uh, like hardware hacking device or just like general hacking device, ESP. I would, of course, I really <laughs> love the ESP8266. I think it's a super versatile um, device. But um, for like other security stuff, I I still really like the USB rubber ducky. I think that for teaching people about uh, security, for teaching people about programming, especially for people who are maybe not that technical, it's mm -hmm. the best way I can teach beginners about programming because I'm like, all right, you know how to like, you know, go to a website, right? right. They're like, yes. I'm like, all right, well, write down every step that you do on your keyboard in order mm -hmm. to get there. And then let's program this thing to follow those steps and see if you can make a program that does something that you do. And even kids or beginners mm -hmm. can get that concept and make something creative. And it scales up to being as, van as advanced as you want uh, it to or be. The generic version of that would be the DigiSpark. Yeah, or the, the DigiSpark, which we've done workshops yeah. on as well. Basically a human interface device attack. I prefer the Wi-Fi duck or the Wi-Fi duck or the USB rubber ducky because it's much more simple and you don't need to know mm -hmm. Arduino, the structure of Arduino code, all that stuff. So I would say like I really, really, really like those sorts of projects that are really basic, relatively cheap, and get beginners engaged and excited with programming. Um, aside from that, I would also say I love Alpha Wireless. Um, they have incredibly mm -hmm. high quality uh, like wireless like hacking stuff. Like my favorite is still the Tube U wireless network adapter that's like for boats, uh, <laughs> and it's like waterproof and just amazing. Uh, so if you are a Wi-Fi hacking nerd, then Alpha so you can Wireless. Hack on a boat. Yeah, uh, yeah, or hack other boats. Um, but yeah, if, a boat from a boat. if you're interested in like Wi-Fi hacking stuff, I personally really like Alpha Wireless and Simple Wi-Fi. Um, we have a, a really nice Yagi antenna from Simple mm -hmm. Wi-Fi that we managed to get like three miles of range from, and that just like blows my mind. Yeah, that was line of sight, mind you. You're not gonna get that. Like, well, of course, yeah. Well, we were measuring line of sight. We're not measuring through concrete bricks <laughs> or water, Michael. Thank you. Um, but yes. Um, can you please make a video about how to install Wi-Fi adapter driver? Plez, I am learning to install RTL, but can't install. All right, Actually, so- Actually, that was one of the first live streams we ever did when we were starting this channel. Yeah, so, um, all right. So when you're working with wireless network adapters, they need to have a driver that allows you to work with the system. If you have a wireless network adapter that isn't supported by default in Kali Linux, then you've chosen to go the hard route. If you've done this, then I'm sorry, but there's going to be some steps that don't apply to everyone that will apply to you. So my first recommendation is get a cheap wireless network adapter card that is compatible with Kali Linux. Mm -hmm. Look it up, uh, Panda They're Wireless like and Alpha. If you want to go cheap, go Panda Wireless. If you want to have higher quality stuff, go Alpha Wireless. But they explicitly state which ones are available mm -hmm. with, to work with Kali Linux. If you don't want to spend your days installing drivers and stuff, 
highly recommend you just make that choice first. If you ignored me on this, or if you already have one that doesn't quite work, I have to say Kali Linux changes all the time and trying to walk you guys through like an installation of a driver, mm -hmm. shoot me in the face. Um, it, it depends on your operating system. It depends on like what version of, of mm -hmm. whatever card you got is. Uh, knowing the chipset is definitely helpful. Helpful. So that's like mm -hmm. good on you for for um, providing that. The RTL eighteen nineteen or whatever this is. Um, I see that this one. If I just look it up, um, and just type in Kali Linux. Do you want uh, to it, show your screen? Sure, don't. Um, you can see that there's like a GitHub project that is specifically about this that has the Linux driver. It has uh, an installation, and I'm going to drop the link in there. So hopefully this answer answered your question. But my general advice is Google it, because you're going to have to do a lot of Googling if you do not buy a wireless network adapter that's compatible with Kali Linux already. Sorry. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and go with this next question. Okay. Um, what is forward? This is from our friend um, Squall, uh, who makes a hacking channel in French. So if you speak French, then I recommend checking it out. He's great. Um, so forward is forward. FWD is just forward. So security yeah. forward. We're pushing security forward. It's we're us being cute forwarding our security, security forward. to you. We're, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were just trying to think up a, a, a cool. We successfully thought up a cool yes, name. Yes, a awesome name that involves FWD. Might not translate well into French. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lost in translation, perhaps. Um, next question. Yep. Um, do you guys have a schedule for when you do live streams? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. We do Tuesday mornings and Friday afternoons. Um, it's Tuesday at 9 Mountain Time. Yep. And then Friday at 1 Mountain Time. So you'll have to translate into whatever. Yeah. If you don't live in the mountains like us, you'll have to translate in, <laughs> into your local time zone. But we're live on Tuesdays and Fridays, Fridays in the evening, and mm -hmm. uh, Mondays. Tuesdays in the morning, which I hate. Um, yeah. Next question. Yeah. Let's next, let's do the next question. Um, what laptop do you use? That's a great question. So I have been frantically trying to get the good people at Dell and <laughs> Lenovo to give me a Dell XPS or a Lenovo, a newer Lenovo mm -hmm. ThinkPad, um, just because I want to have a dedicated Linux computer and they have some really nice options. I have not been able to finagle my way into a free one so far. Yeah. Um, so as a result, I am using a MacBook Pro the way I have been, been using for like three or four years now. Mm -hmm. I like MacBooks because they're very like Linux-like and that you can do most of the things that you're going to want to do with Kali Linux on a MacBook computer. And in general, like they just tend to be bought for me by the companies I work for. So that's a very yeah. easy choice to make when someone else is footing the bill. In general, I for my Linux stuff, I have a, an older like it had like a like a like a CD drive older yeah. um, uh, Lenovo ThinkPad, and um, I like that a lot actually. I I know a lot of other hackers like Lenovo systems, especially ThinkPads. And uh, yeah, so the ThinkPads seem to be really popular with hackers in general. Um, but I also tried out a Librem uh, laptop, which uh. <laughs> I had. I, I kind of felt it like was, I was very like, secure. Okay, so they gave me they gave me the laptop for free. Um, I wanted to try it out, and let's just say that it encrypted everything um, and then l deleted the key. So uh, it turns out this was just like a bug that had been around for like a year or so. And that for me was like, I just pulled the, the shoot and I was like out of there. I was like, yeah. oh good, all my work for three weeks is encrypted. That's so secure. <laughs> like, yeah. Not even I can access it. So um, I've tried out a bunch of different uh, laptops, mm -hmm. both from like dedicated like hacking Linux laptop, which frankly frustrated me to, uh, you know, like an older like uh, right. ThinkPad. I was very satisfied with that. So I'm um, reading into this question a little. What I would ask as well is, uh, for people getting into hacking or looking for a new laptop, what would you recommend? Uh, I can answer part of that at least. Sure. Like, um, people who are just starting out in hacking maybe want to play around with Linux and stuff. I'd actually recommend not getting a laptop, getting a Raspberry Pi, just to you know dip your toe in the water and start with that. If you decide you do want a, a Linux system or something like that, um, I would look into the Dell XPS um, Developer Edition. Mm. Um, and that's going to come with Ubuntu on it, and then you can put in any other Linux system you want on that. Mm -hmm. And that's going to work pretty well if you're comfortable with that system. Um, 
Do you have any other particular recommendations? No, no. I'm, just I just what I'm, you said previously. Uh, I see that a lot of people like the Dell, the new Dell Developer XPS, and then a lot of people like just Lenovo ThinkPads. So those mm -hmm. are like pretty typical hacker laptops that you know I would yeah. love one. Um, so, but again, me personally, <laughs> I use a MacBook Pro for a lot of my stuff. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't make next anything question. For it. Yeah. Okay. Um, who is best for offline attacks? Hydra, John, or Hashcat? So. Basically, um, yeah. I want so to decrypt for, some passwords. Yeah, so there's uh, so there's online and offline uh, attacks. I would say um, Hashcat it tends to be the pick um, that I hear. John is a little bit older, mm -hmm. and um, although Hydra, I think John Hydra, the Ripper. Just yeah, John the Ripper. Ripper. Um, I would say Hashcat, um, if I was just going to mm -hmm. call that out. We, we went to a hacker conference last year and specifically asked everybody what their favorite hacking tool was. And the number one response we got back was Hashcat. Yeah. Like, but hands down. I, I think, too, I think it's Hashcat. There's a really interesting video on Hack5 channel with the developer of that and, like, the PC builds they did to decrypt passwords. <laughs> and, like, you know, it's been very popular to use GPU mining rigs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for like cryptocurrency, but you can actu actually repurpose those to decrypt passwords with like Hashcat and stuff. So you could p potentially throw like 12 GPUs at the problem and stuff. Mm -hmm. You sure could, you sure could. Um, are you guys really in the mountains? Hell yeah, we are. I wish I could post pictures, but we are <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, uh, real great. mountain men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost snuck into Canada by accident. Um, all right. Uh, how do you make Wi-Fi bad USB? So you want to put together a Wi-Fi duck. Uh, the Wi-Fi duck is a project we've covered a lot. It's basically just what you said. It's a Wi-Fi connected bad USB. You need two cheap Wi-Fi microcontrollers. Um, sometimes they're a little hard to find. Like uh, if you're just trying to buy them up from China for the absolute cheapest, you can usually get them on Amazon for a little bit more, or you can go to, I think we still have some up on hackerinterchange.com for leftover from the Hope Conference where we did a, uh, we made bad USBs. So you can always buy them yourself and just put them together, or you can pick up a fully assembled one leftover from the Hope Conference uh, on that website, which is also on my Twitter bio. So um, you can either make one or uh, you can uh, buy one yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, let's do the next question. Uh, I'm a noob. Should I use a VPN when using Kali Linux for safety purposes? Yes. Uh, wait, what do you mean? Uh, so that question's confusing because if you're using a VPN, that implies that you, or wait, uh, a VPN or a, v, or a virtual machine? VPN. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, so you should always use oh. a VPN. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, regardless of what you're doing, you should use a VPN. Um, Especially if you're doing anything sketchy, you should use a VPN. Or if you're trying a tool you've never mm. used before, you should use uh, a VPN. Yeah, there's also an older article on Nullbyte uh, about how to use Hunix, Tor, and a VPN together so that you're basically using Tor over a VPN, uh, which is a little more secure than just using a straight-up VPN. Um, so yeah, investigate which VPN. Don't use a free VPN. You should use a paid VPN, and even then, um, carefully select which one. Uh, we have VPN, haha, ha, no, hell no. Okay, bro, don't use a VPN, but I have three different guides on how you can mess up someone's local connection and serve them phishing pages, see mm -hmm. everything they're doing, and you know, basically like completely take over their data connection, make your computer the center that is completely blocked by a VPN. So if you don't want to use a VPN, that's completely your right. Don't, you know. Yeah. Safety well, third. there's other reasons to use a VPN too. Like if you're concerned that your internet service provider is spying on your traffic, uh, but then also you would need to lock down your DNS or use it. Well, and if you're really concerned about security, privacy, and you yeah. don't want to just offset that problem to the VPN provider, you can always roll your own VPN if you really mm -hmm. want to be a nerd about it. But uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard of someone just like hating on VPNs as a concept um, because they're great and they really mess up my day as a Wi-Fi hacker when I'm trying to do stuff on a network and maybe trick someone into giving me their password mm -hmm. or otherwise looking into all the creepy stuff they're doing. Yeah, and importantly, so, uh, if you're going to use I can't a, see all that stuff if you have a VPN. If you're going to use a VPN, enable the internet kill switch so that you don't ever accidentally use the internet without the VPN. It's very yeah, annoying. But there's, I it. mean, there's, there's lots and lots of reasons to mm -hmm. use a VPN as a security person. And uh, in particular, if you're ever worried about your local traffic or if you want to make sure that, for example, your internet service provider isn't collecting and selling yeah. your information, Probably a good well, thing like, to for do. example, I would never go to Starbucks and not use a VPN. Oh yeah, and then also <laughs> like, if you're on an untrusted, an untrusted public network, it's basically limitless the number of things that I can do to your connection, and your computer's not going to be able. To
able to tell the difference between a rogue mm. network and a real network because it's an open network, so there's no authentication. Yeah. Uh, next question? Yeah. Uh, would this still work if the server had fail to ban configured? I think that was on a video about brute forcing SSH stuff. And yes. yeah, fail to ban is definitely one of those ways to help protect against those things. So the attack here that we're talking about is basically you have an SSH with a, mm -hmm. uh, you have an SSH server with a password, bad idea, and uh, because you should be using a key file. But uh, you have an SSH server with a password and someone's trying to brute force it. and. We, there's lots of different ways of doing this that hit it many, many, many times. And if there's no rate limiting, then eventually you'll get in, provided the password is weak and it's somewhere on your password list. But if you have something like failed to ban configured, then it, as soon as it gets uh, enough uh, wrong attempts, then it'll lock you out and won't allow the attack to continue. And those are the kinds of protections that, you know, it's kind of common sense if you're going to be exposing something to the internet, mm -hmm. especially if you insist on having a password instead of a key file. Yeah. Uh, do you have? Yeah, other... I've got another question. So, are you like to use Signal? Is this safe? What do you uh, want to say? Um, so, Signal is actually how the majority of my team communicates. Uh, we really like Signal uh, for a variety of reasons. I, in particular, like Signal because I, the developer of Signal is someone who makes their work very public. They've been mm -hmm. a privacy advocate for a very long time. It's not some random company, you know, that has some other objective uh, that's like seriously money making. Um, I really appreciate that the fact that the Signal Foundation is really open and transparent about their, what they're doing. Their code is open source. Like I, I think that end-to-end -end encryption should be a standard that most people adopt, and Signal Messenger is generally one of the easiest uh, to use types of messaging. So if you are not using Signal Messenger, I highly recommend it. Uh, every journalist I talk to that is serious about security uses it. Most um, like hackers that I know will use Signal. So yeah, um, the majority of people in my phone book use Signal. Um, uh, continuation of that question, uh, what do you think about WhatsApp? I, I don't like it. OK, yeah, because that is a question we get frequently on the Nullbyte channel is, oh, what's Cody's WhatsApp? Yeah, freaks me out. Don't have. I think I have like an old one for communicating with like people in Europe who like love WhatsApp. But and then also we used to do uh, back when I worked in a different industry. We used to work with a lot of fashion buyers, especially ones um, from like Brazil. And for some reason in South America, WhatsApp is like like the number one way of communication. It is not especially secure. And I believe it's either WhatsApp or Telegram that you have to turn on like end-to-end -end encryption by default. Mm -hmm. I just it, it's not my favorite chat app. I don't think that it's as good as Signal um, for privacy um, my people. Mm -hmm. Although there are some recent additions to Signal that a lot of people don't like, like pins and some of the, the other backup stuff. Cool. Uh, you want me to do another question? Yeah, let's do it. Um, does it work for GSM ISM catching? I believe this was on one of the SDR videos. I have no idea. Let's skip it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, with an SDR, you can capture some stuff, but you can't really like you can only read like the headers. You can't really decrypt like the message or anything. Um, so I, I know that's going to be disappointing. But uh, if you look up the RTL SDR website, they have a bunch of good articles on there about that sort of stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, hey man, I'm trying to learn Python. What is the most important things to know? Oh, a message from Batman. Um, okay, well, I'm first of all, Batman, I'm really excited that you've chosen to get into code. Um, I think that it's going to turn your life around, and you'll yeah. find that your physical skills might not be as important as your mental skills. So that's uh, great. We're also accepting small donations of like oh, billions yeah. of dollars because yeah. you're the richest superhero. Okay, oh, I, I <laughs> yeah. didn't know that. But okay, so <laughs> also, um, yeah, if you want to get into Python, the most important things to know are probably how to use APIs, I would say, is what kept me from getting mm -hmm. bored with Python as soon as I learned the basics. So once you learn like how to do basic things in Python, you've gotten through your first like course or two in Python, and you feel like you know, you're you're mm -hmm. more than just writing like a for loop at that point. Right. Then the next step is to learn how to connect into other bigger data sources so that you're working either with live data or data that makes mm -hmm. your software powerful. Sometimes I'll just sit down and write like a wrapper for like an OSINT searching tool to just search an API. Or I think one of the first ones I wrote just literally tells you like how many people are in space mm -hmm. and um, like where where yeah. the ISS is. And then also Query is the third API that tells me which country it's over, if it's over a landmass. So like little projects like that teach you about programming. They teach you about mm -hmm. using data. Sometimes they teach you about big data, too. So you can start to see how other people are using it in their projects. And I think that it's really exciting enough that somebody that's just starting to learn how to code will have a lot more fun with Python than you know just sticking to you know 
getting more and more and more advanced, but not using like outside APIs or, or learning to right. work with that. So kind of like stuff. what I would recommend is learn all the basics first for loops, while loops, all your different loops, uh, writing definitions, writing classes. Um, and then after that, you can get into like APIs and dealing with data structures um, and stuff like that. So we have one question, which is how much RAM would be needed to perform brute force faster? That is a uh, relationship that goes on forever. Um, well, also, it, like if you brute forcing isn't the compute, well, there's like multiple bottlenecks. Like, wouldn't you need like more GPU power if you're like locally brute forcing? You can use you can use CPUs or GPUs. It's um, it's also like for RAM. Um, like yeah, using a GPU or a, yeah. Yeah, like, like I don't think RAM is the bottleneck. Uh, for, I mean, unless yes. I'm misinterpreting your question, uh, GPU or CPU power, or like FPGA would be even better if you knew a specific algorithm was being used. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have another question about the Wi-Fi panel. We already answered that one. Sorry. Um, we as soon as we find a good project that mm -hmm. is currently supported, we'll let you guys know. But unfortunately, right now the only one we know about the Wi-Fi pumpkin is not currently maintained. Um, I study at a pharmacy in Bangladesh. I like to learn hacking every time. What do you say about me? I say you're great. I learned about hacking when I was the head of security at a rowdy music venue in Los Angeles. So wherever mm -hmm. you are, like however you choose to learn about it, yeah. then you know do we, it. We uh, recently did a video on Hack Five about um, people coming from different careers into hacking, and it's very common for people to make uh, midlife like career changes. And in fact, we plan on doing a live stream in the near future about that sort of thing. So you know. Not, not maybe that you're wanting a career change, but I don't know. Just, you might find it interesting. Yeah, and um, back to the last question, just about like cracking and stuff. If you want to get into like brute forcing and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and you want to like play it around, uh, I hear that Google Colab gives you root access to two pretty snappy GPUs if you ever wanted to try that out. So mm -hmm. if you want to like learn about that, just Google like Google, Google Colab brute forcing GPUs, yeah. and like I think you'll find that there's basically free hardware out there for you to try out uh, brute forcing and see how it works. A so. lot of the cloud service providers like Azure and uh, Google Cloud both provide a certain amount of free time when you create an account as well. Just mm -hmm. saying. Yeah, so there's online resources as well to do like cracking stuff. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn about it, you don't have to rely on your, you know, your like, I don't know, uh, like although, Chromebook or whatever although you're trying to learn on. Something I would remind people about there is the word list is is just as important as the hardware. Don't get too hardware focused because a good word list can help you out a lot more than just throwing a dictionary at it. Next question. Um, wasn't Buscador OS removed? Right, so there was some drama around Buscador OS. And if you guys don't know what this is, it is a virtual machine that is specifically meant for OSINT research. And this mm -hmm. is produced by Mike Bazell. He's really great, but his website basically was the target of a sustained campaign of just like attacks that uh, forced his hosting provider to issue him an ultimatum, either take down certain parts of his website, uh, which were being targeted by automated tools. Basically, he had a whole bunch of OSINT resources out there that people were plugging into and using bots to automate. And it caused his hosting provider to be like, you need to take this stuff down. Mm -hmm. So he took down a bunch of stuff, including Buscador OS, which is really, really an awesome operating system. But then he noticed that immediately people started uploading like pirated versions that like, were absolutely full of malware. So he was like, oh my god, like I've created a situation where mm -hmm. people really want this thing. Now they can't get it, and they're just gonna download like malware infested like you know operating yeah. systems. So he was like, damn, I have to fix this. So he put it back up. So it was down for a little bit. You can still get the Buscador operating system from um, IntelTechniques.com, I believe. Uh, I highly recommend it. We have a number of different guides on it. Um, but if it is not available, if something has changed since I looked last, then please do not download a bootleg mm -hmm. version. Um, there is a problem of those being infected with malware. I, I would say that with any security software. If it's not from the original website or from GitHub, don't touch it. It's so likely to have malware in it, it's not even funny. Um, but yeah, on that note, we're almost out of time. Do you have any final questions you want to answer? Yeah, so I want to get two from the uh, two more questions from the audience. First, um, just thank you guys uh, for you know watching our streams and being part of Nullbyte and all that. 
We really appreciate all the feedback we get from you, and we do this because we love the hacking community, and we want you guys to have the best information, and also just to get to talk to you a bit. So thank you guys for asking your questions, being here, joining us, and supporting the Nullbyte, the Security Forward, and the Hack5 channels, because mm -hmm. we love doing this stuff, and we really like uh, just getting to talk to you. So. Um, another question was, uh, what websites do you use to stay up to date with the cybersecurity world? I really like that. I used to go onto GitHub and look for projects that uh, were trending, basically, and mm -hmm. had like a certain number of stars that were had just been updated, were new. I found a lot of great stuff that way. I also will go on Kitploit and look for different projects. Kitploit doesn't discriminate. They put up absolute crap projects and they put up amazing projects, but mm -hmm. they do focus on security related projects and bring a lot of really interesting ones to people who might not have heard about them. So I discover a lot of different tools through Kitploit. And last, I find m even more stuff through Twitter. So uh, InfoSec Twitter is, I find to be a very welcoming place, uh, provided you follow the right people. If you want to mm -hmm. follow, like copy some of my follow list, feel free to. I follow a lot of really great people. And I find that there's lots of professionals and security researchers who are releasing amazing content on Twitter. And just by you know checking it out every day, I find a lot of stuff that I either end up covering on the show or that totally blows my mind and I have to do for myself. So highly recommend those three sources. Michael, do you have any? Um, yeah, I would just say Twitter as well. Um, you could check out the Nullbyte website. Um, that's going to be more like articles and not like up-to-date newsy kind of thing. Um, and Attack, I think, is one of those websites. There's like a couple. If um, you just like Google like hacking news and stuff like that, you could. My only advice also is not Reddit. I don't mean to hate no. on that community, but I find them to be like a tiny bit more toxic than like other like hacker no. communities. There's a lot more gatekeeping, and some dude that's like, "Listen, bro, I just reverse engineered ten binaries. You're obviously an idiot and don't belong here, so you shouldn't be answering, even asking the stupid question." Like, I don't find that kind of thing helpful. The gatekeeping, I think, mm -hmm. is like, being a hacker doesn't make you cool. The projects that you do as a hacker and the way that you, like, interact with the community mm -hmm. makes you cool or makes you suck. And, like, if you're someone that doesn't give back to the community, if you're someone that, like, can do literally one thing and think that makes you, like, the best, you will never be able to learn every discipline in hacking. There's so many different things here that are gonna like, you know, always be over your head because no one person can learn all of them. You need to learn to like get along with other hackers and respect their skills, as well as realize that like, just cause you can do this one thing doesn't mean that you can be mean to other people that aren't as skilled as you. So I, I find any community that's going to be open and welcoming and, and help you along your journey, provided you're not doing stuff like, hi, my girlfriend um, uh, might be messaging someone and I need you to hack their cell phones. Like, if that's your level in, of engagement with the hacking community, like you are one of hundreds of people in my direct messages on Twitter that I am ignoring every day. Yeah. But if you're somebody who you know is for legitimate reasons, looking up the stuff, learning about it and sharing it with the community, like that's what you're looking for. And that's the kind of community that is going to bring you the best kind of content to keep you up to date on this stuff and bring you the kind of people you want to engage with. Um, um, and then no, the, the time. Oh yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> wait, no, we had one last question. Uh, okay. what does a hacker carry around on a day-to-day -day basis? Daily carry? Yeah. Cell phone. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> I can't help my sarcasm. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, like, um, a cell phone's can do a lot of hacking stuff. I don't know. Like, I don't carry a bunch of hacker stuff around on a daily basis. It's because he's a um, but I'm more fake gamer girl. No, fake ha hacker boy. There you go. Oh, uh, but uh, no. So um, what I carry uh, is, of course, a smartphone. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a browser in it. You can interface with uh, Wi-Fi scanner. stuff. I have uh, on that. I have a bunch of different apps um, yeah. like Fing Scanner, um, Wiggle Wi-Fi for collecting yeah. data and a bunch of SSH tools and VNC mm. tools. So then I also usually have with me either a Wi-Fi duck, which means if I find an open USB port, I can inject whatever I want into mm -hmm. it from my cell phone. And I also have a, um, a Wi-Fi D author, but the V2 version that has the mm -hmm. web interface. So if someone is annoying me, um, or if I need to like scan something or cut off a Wi-Fi connection, I can do all that from my phone. It's basically like having a wireless card mm -hmm. I can address over Wi-Fi with me all of the time. So I think that those are two really cool things. One of them is like an upgraded version of the USB rubber ducky yeah. that you don't have to program with a computer. You can program it live or select a pre-recorded um, thing. So those are two things I usually have with me. Just uh, charger, because backup battery, or charger, also. backup battery. I bring lock picks with me everywhere. I get yeah. locked out of stuff all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've had to use lock picks in in like a perfectly acceptable usage. And people are like, I am so glad mm -hmm. you have those. Um, that's probably it. So like lock picks, computer computer lock picks, and then. Uh, 
uh, a phone in order to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. Just because you know the smartphone has Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, like everything you would yeah. need to connect to a small device and get it to do well, something. So I usually have my my smartphone as like the center of my little hacking. I, I guess you could also consider like your laptop like daily carry too, because like uh, you know backpack with you all the time you can carry a lot more i don't know if you're doing like everyday carry in as far as like pockets or like i think every time i go out i usually have like a backpack with me with all every the time you go stuff. out you are wearing gym shorts and carrying <laughs> nothing with you i don't believe you at all so yeah. <laughs> but that's just maybe things have changed uh okay, okay. But uh, wait, why don't you guys do YouTube anymore? Is it because of the guidelines? We do YouTube all the time. Yeah, um, go this check is on out YouTube. The, check out, this is on YouTube. Check out the Null Byte channel on YouTube where I just did a video for, and then also check out um, mm -hmm. Hack5, which we also put Well, I, I think what he's, or they're asking more likely is just why aren't you on the Null Byte channel? Oh, no, um, I'm still on the Null Byte channel. Yeah. I just have so much other stuff to do, and honestly, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, to bring up some other like young hackers. Nick, uh, one of our new co-hosts, is a uh, student at uh, UCLA who's a fantastic engineer and has been with us with, uh, for a long time, as with a production person and now as a host. So in between getting Nick up and running, having Michael burnish his career as a co-host, and you know just being involved with a lot of other gremlin. projects, we're working for Hack 5 again, so making new Hack 5 episodes. It mm -hmm. takes up a lot of my time. So I don't do as many Null Bytes, uh, Null Byte videos as I used to, but I still love mm -hmm. all you bytes and I appreciate um, checking in. But yeah, we do have to be careful of the hack, the hacking content guidelines on right. YouTube and make sure we don't do anything that's gonna make them angry. People report us all the time and if it gets to a moderator that doesn't understand the format of our mm -hmm. show or think we're teaching people how to break into stuff, then we get strikes yeah. and that can, that can cause problems. Well, and also so. like there's tons of people in the comments all the time. Um, doing malicious spam and like, yeah, it's tedious going through. I have lockpicks in my phone case. Me too. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. So that's all we have for today. We're going to cut things off. We've been on for an hour now. We've had lots of really great mm -hmm. questions. And again, we love just getting feedback from you guys. So if you have any questions for next time, if you like this, if you have any feedback, let us know uh, on Twitter. Let us know in the YouTube comments on the channel, which I'll drop in the, secu the Security Forward YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd love to hear from you. We'll start doing these more often if you guys like them. And yeah, uh, just, just be Power aware. PowerShell course? Well, oh, wait, well, we're not yeah. done. <laughs> but uh, if you have any specific questions, any technical mm -hmm. questions, make sure to give us as much information as possible ahead of time. Some of the questions we couldn't mm -hmm. answer today were just like too specific or too technical, but broader questions or like, you know, things that we've covered in the past, like on a stream, we can always answer those questions. So yeah, uh, just don't want to disappoint anyone. So as always, a big shout out and thank you to Veronis for making this amazingly part of my job, just getting mm -hmm. to hang out with you guys, answer your questions and uh, just, yeah, kind of get to know our audience. So if you want to check out some more great free content from Baronis, you can always check out the PowerShell AD course, as Michael was uh, bringing mm -hmm. up. It's a great way to get started if you're interested in working in Active Directory, but won't, don't want to do everything manually. Uh, so mm -hmm. check that out. Check out our next stream, uh, which will be on Tuesday. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Bye.